I sincerely thank the organizers of this Kyoto Earth Hall of Fame for their invitation to become a laureate. Uh, Japan is famous for taking a long view. The Earth Hall of Fame is an important example of that, and I'm truly honored that you believe my efforts may help secure a more attractive environment for humanity. That goal has uh, guided me as I prepared this speech, where I will present three main ideas. First, 45 years ago, uh, our research uh, forecast that human society would go beyond sustainable levels and that physical expansion would end on the planet in the early decades of the 21st century. That's now. Through an escalating series of environmental crises. Current events confirm that view. Uh, the second idea, efforts to preserve the environment focus mainly on symptoms, not the real problem, which is continuing growth in population, material use, and energy flows. Until that growth stops, environmental crises are going to continue. And the third idea, the crises will differ in their susceptibility to solution. Uh, because society's time is short and its resources are limited, it should ignore those crises that will solve themselves or that are impossible to avoid. Uh, society's efforts should concentrate instead on the remaining crises, those that are difficult but solvable. The global environment cannot be preserved in its current form, but it can be made more resilient so that it will deteriorate less and recover quickly from the crises we cannot avoid. Uh, our 1972 book, The Limits to Growth, didn't predict the future. It presented 13 different possible development paths for the global society extending out through the year 2100. Figure one presents one of those 13 World 3 computer projections. Uh, we call this the reference future, and I will use it uh, to introduce my talk this afternoon. In uh, figure one, the red vertical line, this one here, uh, intersects the key variables in the year 1972, so 72. That's the year that we published our report. Back then, there were no immediate problems to be seen, at least on a global average basis. 45 years ago, the vast majority of non-renewable resources were still unused. Population was growing, but food production per person and industrial output per person were still rising. There was only a small amount of persistent pollution. Yet our model research already convinced us 45 years ago that society's physical growth phase would stop within the first few decades of the 21st century. In fact, in 1972, 45 years ago, we wrote, if present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production, resource depletion continue, the limits to physical growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years. We foresaw that the policies which produced relatively attractive results in the last part of the 20th century would lead to serious problems now in the early part of the 21st. And I think that view has been vindicated. Today, four and a half decades later, global society has reached a point in time indicated in the figure one by the black vertical line. So now we are here, about uh, 2017. There the model shows many problems. One fifth of the non-renewable resources have been used. You see? The remaining resource reserves are declining rapidly. 
per capita food production is almost stagnant and persistent pollution has grown many fold since 1972. It's beginning a rapid ascent. Growth in industrial output per person has reached an inflection point. Just here. Uh, so, the inflection point, an absolute decline is only a few decades in the future. Of course, the problems implied by figure one for today were only hypothetical projections when we made them back 45 years ago. But recent research in several nations and daily reports in the news media of most countries strongly suggest the model was accurate. The globe's peoples have entered into an era where physical growth is declining. The quickening of climate change, the spreading of soil erosion, expansion of oil, ocean pollution, acceleration of species loss, they're all obvious indications. There's also more subtle evidence. Authoritarian leaders, mass migrations, energy scarcity, debt inflation, big problem in the United States and Japan, are also harbingers of a transition away from growth. When contemplating figure one, it's natural to assume that humanity would start experiencing the greatest crises during the period where the growth trends have passed their peak and are starting down, when population, industry, food production, and resource availability are all in decline uh, in the years after 2040. But that's not correct. Humanity is entering now into the period of greatest problems. The issues that are considered to be environmental threats, such as soil erosion, climate change, they are not actually the fundamental problems. They are really more usefully to be considered symptoms. The fundamental problem are continued physical growth of population, material, and energy flows on a finite world. The issues to considered to be problems are the planet's way of resisting that growth. They will be strongest now, not after the trends have reversed and the forces promoting growth have become much weaker. These crises are accelerating, even in Japan. In the next 50 years, the Japanese people will experience more changes in environment, economy, and politics than have occurred here since the Meiji Restoration. More. Until physical growth stops on this planet, there is no possibility whatsoever of preventing continued deterioration of the Earth's environment. The fact is shown elegantly by the Kaya identity, an equation formulated by Professor Yoichi Kaya, president of an important research institute which is headquartered here in Kyoto. Kaya's equation expresses the interrelationship among four factors causing the growth in CO2 emissions. The top line of figure two is the original form of the identity. In the bottom line of figure two, I expanded Kaya's names for the four factors to make them more easily understood. I might say, incidentally, Yoichi Kaya is an old friend of mine. Uh, it was my pleasure to work with him at MIT back in 1972 when we did that first study. He came over and was part of our team. The identity states that the amount of CO2 emitted, F, is equal to the population, P, multiplied by gross domestic product per person, G over P, multiplied by the amount of energy per unit of GDP, that's E over G, and that multiplied by the amount of CO2 emissions per unit of energy, which is F over E. Society is explicitly trying to reduce the last two of those causal factors. And the Kyoto Accord is an important force to achieve that. But unfortunately, society is implicitly increasing the first two. Concern about CO2 emissions has produced many efforts to reduce the amount of energy required for each unit of output. Uh, that is to lower E over G by making the economy more efficient. 
And there are also many efforts to reduce the fraction of energy derived by combusting fossil fuels, that is, to lower F over E by spurring growth in the production of renewable energy. But human birth control is now considered to lie outside the realm of legitimate political action, and attention is mainly focused on reducing the death rate. Of course, that makes P larger than it would have been otherwise. And most nations are actually striving to increase material living standards, G over P. So in the prevailing capitalistic democracies, the forces promoting growth and material consumption will inevitably dwarf the forces reducing fossil energy use. Now comes the most important sentence in my speech today. If you remember only one thing I say, please remember this. Until humanity massively pursues reductions in the first two terms of the Kaya identity, population and material living standards, its impact on the last two terms will never be large enough to cause a decline in total emissions. Experience over the last two decades makes this clear. Despite hundreds of research projects, thousands of publications, and hundreds of thousands of meetings, greenhouse gas emissions are not declining. Indeed, several recent years have seen them uh, added more to the global environment than ever before in human history. Kaya's equation specifically addresses CO2 emissions, but its lessons apply to most of the other environmental problems on this planet. The environmental problems looming on this planet will require political actions and investments far greater than what will be available. Thus, society needs to become more selective in the problems it addresses. Some problems will solve themselves. They can be ignored. Others are impossible to solve. Society can only strive to reduce their consequences. The biggest possibility of preserving the environment requires a focus on the remaining problems, the ones that are more or less difficult, but possible to solve. To differentiate among threats to the environment that can and cannot be avoided, recognize that problems differ along two important dimensions, time and space. Uh, to simplify, I'll assume that solving an environmental problem requires an action whose costs are paid here and now. And further, I'll assume that the action is actually effective. It does produce beneficial results. However, those beneficial results will be distributed across time and space. They may be experienced soon, within months or years, or they may be experienced later, only over decades or centuries. The main benefits may be experienced locally, by those who pay the costs, or they may be experienced globally, principally by those who do not pay because they live far away in other political jurisdictions. Those distinctions permit one to differentiate amongst four types of issues, as I've shown in figure three. Notice we have local and global, soon and later. Of course, no problem fits unambiguously into just one of these four boxes. However, it's possible to assign most problems predominantly to one or another of them. Uh, for example, much of Beijing's urban air pollution arises from activities within China. That makes the issue local soon. So we have uh, urban air pollution, local soon. But the air pollution, which blows in from other countries, into Beijing is a global soon problem. The effects are global, the impact is now. Some polluted waters, surface uh, waters migrate into the ground. As they do, water pollution shifts from being a local soon to a local later issue. Local soon, surface water pollution, local later ground water pollution. The distinction is crucially important since different problems require very different political 
and economic approaches. Local problems can be solved within one political entity, for example, a city or a nation, without enlisting those further away in the effort. Rising urban air pollution and declining forests are local problems. Most people around the world confront these problems. However, the Japanese people were able to reduce Tokyo's air pollution and reforest its mountains without enlisting Beijing or New York or London or other major capitals in the effort. Global problems, in contrast, cannot be solved by actions in only one location. They require that many people in different regions agree on the solution and work together to implement it. Rising greenhouse gas emissions and declining ocean fisheries are global problems. The Japanese people will not be able to reduce climate change or to restore ocean fish stocks without enlisting Beijing and New York and London and other major capitals in the effort. This gets very much into the topics that Margaret was uh, talking about. The timing of the benefits is also important because most leaders strongly prefer to take actions that will make them look successful before the next evaluations of their effectiveness. These evaluations take many forms. Uh, government leaders must stand for election. Corporate leaders are held responsible for daily changes in the price of their stock and they have to report their firm's profits uh, frequently. Administrators, who are typically appointed rather than elected, must submit to annual evaluations by their superiors. With soon problems, decisions to pay the cost of environmental protection will generate signs of progress before the next election. With later problems, leaders who choose to pay the now for the cost of environmental preservation have nothing concrete to demonstrate their success before the next evaluation. Of course, that's one of the major problems we face with climate change. Indeed, their actions may have made the situation appear to be worse before they are next evaluated. For example, the policies that will make energy relatively less expensive and more abundant in the United States later typically make it more expensive and less abundant soon, now. Uh, this fact explains the famous quote by Jean Claude Juncker, who's president of the European Commission. He said, quote, we all know what to do, we just don't know how to get reelected after we do it. The actions to required to solve local soon problems are typically politically and economically attractive. Politicians generally will be supported by their voters to adopt the necessary solutions and industrial leaders generally will be supported by their shareholders to allocate sufficient investment capital to them. Most of the environmental successes achieved so far are in the category soon local. Note that the three earlier Hall of Fame laureates who were recognized uh, for their concrete actions, they were all working on local problems. Occasionally, leaders who are more secure in their positions may also support solutions to local later problems. Uh, for example, here in Japan, Kotaku Wamuro, mayor of Fudai for four decades, built a seawall to protect his town from the next tsunami. Uh, and there have been a few successes with global soon problems. Uh, for example, amongst the first formal in international environmental agreements uh, was a treaty back in 1918 that protected migratory birds. The problems were global, but the benefits of solving the problem were felt locally. However, the actions required to solve later or global problems generally do not generate political or economic rewards that accrue to those who pay the cost. Those ad advocating efforts to deal with later or global problems are generally criticized by their constituents. Uh, that was Mayor Wamura's fate during his lifetime though he was recognized as a hero in 2011, 14 years after he died. His town was one of the very few along the coast that wasn't wiped out by the tsunami. Therefore, politicians generally don't vote for global problem solutions, and industrial leaders do not allocate sufficient investment capital to them. As a consequence, global problems continue to grow, both those mainly affecting the environment and those mainly affecting other aspects of global society. The emissions of greenhouse gases continue to rise. Nuclear weapons continue to proliferate. Potential for global epidemics continues to grow. Uh, 
This is also true for issues outside the environment. The prospect for a crash in the global foreign exchange markets is mounting. The gap between the rich and the poor is rising. Fossil fuel resources are depleting too fast to be replaced fully by renewable energy sources. And these trends persist despite widespread recognition and concern. Recognizing the realities of the political and economic systems that prevail around the world, it's possible to convert the matrix of figure three into a crude classification of environmental problems by their susceptibility to solution. The result is shown in figure four. Note that figure four does not reflect the level of scientific knowledge about different problems. Tractability is mainly a political and an economic issue, not one related to ignorance of the basic facts. Climate deniers aren't ignorant. They just have a short-term perspective. Einstein uh, famously said, we can't solve problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Growth has caused our problems. How do we presume to fix them? More growth. The short-term focus of the economic system has caused neglect of long-term problems. How does society propose to solve them? By relying even more on economic solutions. This hasn't worked before, and it won't work in the future. A different approach is required. To recognize that it's impossible to solve some problems is to acknowledge that shocks and surprises will occur. That doesn't force us to ignore the problem or to despair. It should force us to become realistic. Rather than trying to eliminate all environmental threats, humanity can take actions that make their environment more resilient. With success, the effects of problems will be smaller in extent and shorter in duration. This isn't a new idea. Environmental resilience is becoming more and more popular. It's a goal behind growing emphasis on measures for climate change adaptation, and it's a goal that can help preserve the global environment. Thank you.